Good afternoon from uh, here outside of Barcelona. Uh, my name is Mike Rosenberg. I'm a professor of ESA Business School. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be back with another one of our series of webinars we've been doing on how to manage in these turbulent times. Uh, we schedule these webinars so that uh, it's early in the morning in the United States and late in the evening in Asia. And, and please welcome, uh, welcome to all of you who are tuning in from all around the world. Today, uh, we have Samsa Samila. Samsa is a professor, a colleague of mine in the strategy department. He's originally from Finland where he studied mathematics. He did his doctoral work in, in Columbia University. He's taught in Canada, he's taught in Singapore, and he's been focused lately on the issue of artificial intelligence. And he's here today to talk about why now is really the time and how this, this whole virus, this whole emergency has made it more important than ever for, for managers and executives in all different industries to pay attention to this situation. Uh, Samsa, welcome to the to the series. And, and why are you spending so much of your time on AI? Thanks, Mike, for the introduction. Um, why am I studying AI? Because fundamentally, I think it's, it's such, of such economic importance and of managerial importance that, that we really need to be working on it. <clears throat> so let, let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. So right now we have, as economy, you, you might work on, on sustainability and, and sort of environmental issues are, an, are a humongous issue. But there are other issues that our societies are facing. And one of them is sort of, you know, aging societies, low birth rates, you, you know, declining productivity growth over the last 20, 30 years. And so what, what we need fundamentally in order to sustain our society is to be able to pay for the retirement of us, of those previously and of those coming after us is to be able to raise productivity considerably. And, and right now, artificial intelligence, machine learning are sort of some of the better technologies that are, are giving us opportunities to do that. On the other hand, precisely because of this, they're also the most challenging, some of the most challenging in terms of how we're gonna to have to restructure work, how they're gonna affect competition, how they're gonna affect regulation companies and so on. And so, so there's a huge, need effectively for, for managers to understand this, to learn about it. And, but on the other hand, you, you know, it's also extremely interesting for us academics to study it. It's great for technology, for as a research tool, we're using AI as a tool to analyze data. Uh, so Sam, so you said a lot of words uh, and there's a lot of words being used in this thing. And I know you've been doing uh, uh, seminars for our alumni in different parts of, of Europe. You've been doing a, a course in the ESA Business School, and I know you actually had some uh, webinars also done on the topic. So, so maybe some of the people know more about this than I do, but just maybe very briefly, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, expert systems. What you know of all this stuff? What's really important? What what are we really talking about here? Okay, so um, there's lots of def definitions about artificial intelligence and what it means, what you know, expert systems and everything else, um, but. From my perspective and what, what I see happening is the, the one that's really interesting right now is neural networks. You, you know, I remember writing up, you know, back in high school, I wrote, wrote a student project on artificial intelligence. And at that point, you know, expert systems were interesting. But that sort of thing has gone away, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago because it just didn't lead, and I, you know, for, for sort of big break, breakthroughs in terms of practical applications. All of the applications, all of the cutting edge stuff that's happening now is basically driven by neural networks. Um, and, and sort of machine learning then is, a, is another set of terms that sort of is basically a concept of how you train these neural networks. How, how, do, you, how do you fill in what the, what the values are and what, what, what the neural network does? And so there's, there's basically three ways of doing machine learning, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. But the key thing, key thing, Mike, here to understand is, is, is that you, the way you should think about this whole thing is that it's basically a different way to tell computers what they should be doing. When, you, you know, ever since we built our first computers and up to this day still, what, the way we program computers, you know, whether it's in Python, C++, or whatever language you're using, you're basically producing a set of steps for the machine to do, you're, you're, you're telling step by step, you know, for the computer, do this, do this, do this. Now, you, you know, machine learning and, and you know, it's particularly applied to, to neural networks, 
you're, you're teaching the computer. You're, you're not telling the computer what it should do step by step. You're teaching, you're helping the computer learn. Supervised learning means that you're giving it examples where you know the answer. Unsupervised learning is that you let the algorithm loose on a set of data and to find structure in the data. Reinforcement learning is, is when you, you, know, you, you give the algorithm feedback based on its performance and it, it, it basically learns from experience like, like babies do. And so if you think about it as sort of fundamentally a different way to program computers, I think you, you, you'll get most of the key ideas. And if you- Okay, so, so it's like letting them teach, it's, it's kind of like teaching children. You can teach them very structured ways. You can kind of let them off and learn what they're gonna do anyway. And, and, and let them figure it out. It's kind of like educational philosophies. Is that similar or is that totally wrong? It's not, it's not totally wrong, certainly. In, in so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, in, in, and in many ways it is right. Um, reinforcement learning in particular, literally is, is, is often used in sort of game playing and it has, doesn't have yet a huge number of practical applications. But you, you know the, the way AlphaGo Zero, for instance, was trained is, is that they basically let it loose in, in, in terms of playing Go against itself. You know, two different versions of the algorithm played against each other and, and sort of learned from that playing. Um, you, you know, supervised learning, like, like here in this slide right now, it, you, you know, you, you, have, you have, for instance, pictures of, of brains, of scans of brains, where you know what the diagnosis is and you're training the algorithm to recognize the diagnosis. But so the key thing here is that you don't tell it, you don't tell the algorithm that, look, if there's this thing, then that's a stroke. No, you just show pictures where you know the answer and the algorithm learns by itself through the optimization to identify this. And, and then you can deploy it to sort of diagnose, um, you, you know. Now, yeah. now Sam, so there, there is a lot of, uh, I don't know what it, what it is, um... I'm not sure criticism, concern. There's a lot of debate in, in, in certain circles in society about whether some of this technology is gonna be used for good or for ill, uh, et cetera. I'm not gonna go there because if I understand you correctly, you're saying it, it, that's not the point. The point is this stuff is coming. This stuff is like, you know, um, it, just, it just is, and it's gonna be so widespread. It's gonna be used in so many different places that we've just gotta get over our, our, ourselves and get used to it. And I've used the term, uh, I've heard the term general purpose technology. Is this a general purpose technology? And, and what does that really mean anyway? Mike, you're asking a lot of questions. So let me answer the first one. So, so yes, you, you know, absolutely. I think there is a concern whether this will be used for good or bad. And, and you're absolutely right that this will be everywhere. Now, for in terms of the good or bad, this is one of the reasons why I think us at ESN need to be working on this because we do have a set of values that we represent and we want, we want to make sure that these values are part of the discussion that, of, of how this technology gets used. And so we don't you know, want to leave it necessarily for, for just you, you, you know, lots of other players. We want to be part of this discussion of how this gets used. So in terms of you know, general purpose technologies, um, that's a term that's used by economic historians to describe sort of the foundational technologies that underlie our current system. <coughs> Apologies. And so, you know, you can have examples are steam power, electricity, and obviously digital technologies more recently. And so the key criteria for something to be um, a general purpose technology is that it's it's, it's in widespread use. And by that, we mean that it's used in multiple industries, multiple occupations, multiple different parts of the economy. It's developing rapidly. There's, there's continuous change in terms of how it's used. It is not just a one-shot development, but it's, it keeps improving over time. And that it's a source of new innovations. And, and sort of fundamentally, th this, this is what we can say about machine learning AI right now is that these, these criteria based on our own research into this are, 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 are true. So what, what does that mean in practice? It means that you, you know, if you think about digital technologies, for instance, you know, personal computers came 35 years ago, internet 25 years ago, uh, you know, smartphones almost 15 years ago, and we're still talking about digital transformation. It's still a, a big topic, despite these technologies having been out there for, for you know, decade two or three. 
And the same thing happened when we went from steam power to electricity, it basically required an entire reorganization of the factories to be powered by a new, new source of energy. And so, you, you know, I'm working with, with several C-level executives at large companies and, and what, you, you know, like one of them, for instance, is completely reorganizing his division um, with AI and it's just fundamental restructuring of how the work gets done from basic principles up. And so, you, you know, you, you fundamentally, they're having to rethink everything. And, and in our own research, we find that this, what this means is, is that this, this primarily, or in, there's a big shortage of managers who understand this. And what this means, you know, is that it's, it's a management problem, not just a technological one. And we find that this, if, you comp if you look at sort of the, the skill premium, if you look at the wages that people get, a manager gets a bigger premium for having AI skills than a you know computer scientist. Sure, sure, but 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 you this is like as big as when electricity was was being deployed around the world in the 1920s and 30s. You know, mechanics who don't understand electricity, managers who don't understand electricity, uh, factory designers and factory. If you don't get it, you're just not going to be part of the future. Is that is that you're saying this is that big? Um. Potentially, yes. I mean, that's that's where the evidence is pointing now. And and so if if you know, so so managers do need to learn this in particular because it, it it's just, it's not just a tool that you can plug in into your existing th processes and existing organization, but fundamentally, you know, what I'm what what the evidence sort of from history suggests and what the practical experience of the managers that I talk to suggests, you need to restructure the whole company. In many cases. Yeah, now, by the way, before I, we continue, uh, some of you have already been on the series. You know that if you type in a question into the chat function, either on on LinkedIn, YouTube, or La Vanguardia, because we're being broadcast live on all three different platforms, uh, uh, I have a colleague uh, who will be kind enough to type in your questions into a different application, and I'll see them right here on my iPad, and I'll try to get um, all the questions we can uh, to Professor Samila uh, uh, just as we go through the as we go through the process. Now, why now, Samsa? Why, why, you know, what has this got to do with this virus? What has this got to do with the lockdown? What has this got to do with the new normal uh, that we're gonna be seeing as uh, slowly the economies of the world open up again? So the, the, the way we, we, we've sort of been teaching this and the way I, I think about the necessary conditions for, for applying AI, is basically not only do you need the AI expertise, the machine learning, you know, data scientists and so on, but you need the business expertise and you need the technology expertise and the underlying technologies, the data infrastructure and, and so on. And what's what sort of, you know, the reason I think now is, is one, one reason why I think now is the time is because I think the, the costs have gone down and in part because a lot of the technology, a lot of remote work, online shopping, you know, various digitalization in various parts of the businesses is happening because of the lockdown. You know, we've, we're now adopting new ways of working. We're adopting new technologies. We're, we're learning to use digital tools, you know, you know, more than previously. So that, that means that a big, at least a part of the sort of barrier to adopting these is gone. And we've, had, we've been doing, as you know, a, some, a series of, of sessions with CEOs and, and our dean, and, and I've had people telling us that they have done digitalization that they could never have imagined. You exactly. Know, doing more things online that they never could dream of, and, and it's just going faster, maybe five or ten years in three months, in terms of the pace of digitalization. Exactly. So AI is can then basically be built on top of that. You, you know, some, a lot of the foundational work for need, that's needed for AI applications is getting done already. So that's I mean, what we're, we're starting to get a couple of questions in from people. Uh, there's there's a, a question uh, about the virus. Could we use AI to to predict the next outbreak? And and is there a project going on somewhere in the world to do that? Oh, uh, that that's a really good question, and the answer almost certainly. Uh, at least to the second part of the question is that there's lots of projects trying to go around in the world to sort of predict that. Um, 
whether AI can predict the next wave or whether that, that is in principle predictable is, is, is um, I don't have a direct answer to that. But, but there's a lot of AI and computational power is being used to sort of sort through various you know, molecules that could be used as medicines or vaccines and, and, and sort of a lot of AI tools are being used on that side in, in the innovation process. So, so absolutely, AI, you know, there's, there's even AI tools being developed for sort of quickly diagnosing if a person is infected based on their voice or based on, you know, how, in some other sort of diagnostic criteria. Wow, so now, now here's a question about data. And, and, and I, know you, I know data is important in all this and we hear things like data is the new gold and this kind of stuff. Um, so someone's asking, is AI too dependent on structured data? Uh, is it too dependent? Well, the, the, I'm not sure what, I, what, what it means, too dependent. So I have used the definition, uh, a simplified definition of AI as data-driven predictions based on past patterns, um, which sort of simplifies what we're talking about. But is it too dependent? I don't know. Um, I mean, AI, AI is fundamentally driven by, by data, and so, one question is like, what, what about all the, you know, the new normal? Is the new normal going to basically invalidate all the data? Right, because if the new normal is new and the and the old data is old, and the we teach the AI with the old data, then the new data, then the new normal may not, maybe not apply, and the behaviors that we try to predict won't won't match. Is that is that the question? Exactly. So there is, you, you know, there, there was an article some time ago saying like Amazon is having trouble in some of their predictive algorithms because people's behavioral patterns are different than they used to be now. You, you See, know. That, that's too bad, I, I cry for them, you know? I know, I know, I know, I know. But you, you know, one, one area where we do have some evidence of this is, 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 is I, I, I wanted to see how hedge funds are doing because in hedge funds, you can have some hedge funds are driven by AI algorithms and some are you know, by other means, mostly human managers. And what we saw in hedge fund returns is, is that the AI-driven hedge funds dropped faster initially, meaning that they, you know, they could not match the new normal, but then they learned the new normal faster than the other hedge funds did. So the, you know, and now they are actually doing, you know, they're safe. Oh, the AI managed ones are the blue ones, right? And so they did do yes. a little bit dip and then they leveled off and now they're actually catching up and doing better than the other guys who exactly. took a while to get the message according to the chart. Oh, okay. So the, 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 the basic message in the chart is that the AI funds dropped first and then you know, leveled and are now up versus the you know, human, human managers continue dropping for a while and it took them, human managers, it took them a longer time to figure out the new normal than it did for the algorithms. Now, you, you know, this is clearly a, diff, you know, a unique setting in the sense that there's tons of data to play with. And, and maybe sort of for, for many businesses sort of trying to figure out the few, you know, their customer behavior, the data doesn't come as quickly as it comes in the financial markets. And so maybe the algorithms don't land as fast. Um, but still, it, 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 it is suggestive of the fact that, that, that you know, both humans and algorithms need to learn the new normal. And it's not obvious that the humans have a huge advantage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a slightly different question, but it's still on data. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just go to that before I go to my last question. Um, which is about what we should do, you know, managers should do. But um, it's a question about uh, about bias, and it's a question if if a data scientist transmits their own biases into their into their creations, into the neural networks, and into the AIs they're training. And have you have you have you have you have you looked at that problem? So so bias is a is a huge problem that lots of people are studying, and and sort of the way. Uh, this it's a very crowded area in research as we we call it and, and lots of people are looking at it from an from a practical standpoint ethical standpoint as to what what it should be and it, and and yes if the if the underlying data is biased it's it's possible to sort of buy you know the end result to be biased but but we have also found you, you know I, i'm writing on this with a with a co-author and 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 it's also true that because people react to the computer, you, you know, systems differentially. You know, even a completely unbiased computer system can lead to a biased results because of differential responses to the system. 
So, you, you know, th there's a lot of work that remains to be done to sort of devise systems that are not biased. But, <clears throat> but it's also, you, you know, I'm, I'm a little less concerned about that as sort of a big, big problem precisely because it is well studied and under, understood now that we understand it's a problem. Lots of people are looking at it. Um, so crack it sooner or later. Uh, so I'm sorry, if, if, if someone's on the broadcast and they really don't know much, that much about it or they've done a little bit about it, what should what should managers do if if you say that the entire structure of companies and markets is going to change because of this if you think it's going to be like you know the introduction of telephone systems or, or television or, or, or electricity you know what what should normal people do what what, what should be our approach so I mean, the key thing that I, I keep sort of, and, and the way we've, we, we're doing this at ESA, um, is if, if, you, if you think about the way, so I, I, had, I had a discussion about this with, with senior HR people at a large multinational about the introduction of 3D printing, additive manufacturing compared to um, subtractive manufacturing, the prior ways of doing things. And, and so what the, what the basic finding was, was, was that a lot of the basic rules of thumbs, the, ba the basic ways in which you operated did not apply in the new setting, but all the key principles did. So if a manager wants to sort of make the leap into AI world, the key things to understand is, and, and to sort of learn is to, is to is to start from the basics of what exactly are the customer needs you're serving, to understand your customers, to relate to your customers, to understand what is the work the organization is trying to do, what, you know, and, and then understand, you know, that's where we put the star here is that it's not, it's not enough for the manager to understand the business. The manager needs to understand the AI and the technology, not necessarily at the same level as a data scientist, but they need to understand the core economic principles. What exactly can it do? You know, what are the use cases? How do we work with this? And so on. And so if you're able to relate those to the business needs and the way the organization works, then you're able to take advantage of it. You're able to build on it. You're able to do interesting things. Now, what do you do if you don't have any data scientists in your company and when you start talking to one, you realize you can't afford them anyway or they make more money than you do as a CEO? Um, well, first of all, the, the data scientists, they don't quite make that much money, I have, I have to. You, you know, and they, they, the shortage of data scientists, I think, you know, we're overcoming that over, you know, over time as we train more. And, and that sort of also means increasing supply will also mean, you know, the wages are, are not going to be um, as high as, you know, the CEOs. But, but fundamentally, there are tools that you can get started with without sort of, you know, necessarily a deep understanding of data science. I've, I've spoken with one executive at a, at a sort of a large company that provides, you know, underlying technologies and AI services. And what they found interestingly is that companies that started with prepackaged solutions that didn't need a local data scientist, uh, rather than sort of, a, you know, programming tools, made faster progress than the ones who started with the programming tools. And what, what, what that is telling us, at least or is at least consistent with it, is, is that the key boundary, the key challenge was to get the managers learning what this is, what it can do, rather than getting all the data scientists working right. on so, it. So get off the shelf solutions, get things which work, get your people to become used to using the tools, and then eventually get better tools. Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. I think, so, you, you know, work, you know, work with a consultant, get off the shelf tools or get somebody else to sort of provide you with a, with a solution, learn to use it, get working on it, you know, get a pilot project, get something where the managers get experience working with it and where you, you, you know, the key things to sort of, uh, the, the key things that you will absolutely need is somebody who understands the business value of it and then the underlying technology infrastructure so you have tools to work with. And so, you know, start working at those ends rather than getting a, an army of data scientists. Yeah, uh, one of our, um, so we get lots of questions from, the, I mean, they're coming in really quicker right now, uh, questions from different people. On, on, there's a bunch of questions on different se uh, sectors and I'll get to those in a minute and you can say yes or I don't know, which is fine. Um, but there's a question here about 
you know, there's there's all this discussion. If you if you read anything today, everything is disruptive. Everything is changing. Everything is is a new you know new beginning. Blah blah. How do you tell the facts from the hype? How do you how do you cut through as you read some of this stuff? And how do you try to figure out what's actually true and what's actually changing? Ah, a good question. So the it's not my question. That comes from uh, Yoshidan Navashia. He's one of our people watching us live. Well, we ha we have good audience with good question. <laughs> so the the the, the simple answer is, is 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 that most things are hype. If if we start, <laughs> the, the you know any talk of sort of dramatic disruption at some level is is hype. But the practical sort of the, the practical concerns that I have, for instance, about AI, um, why I think the, 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 that it has the potential to be, you know, disruptive is, is sort of two reasons. One, and, and this, is, this is sort of what managers, this is, these are sort of a couple of the economic principles that managers would have to understand to really sort of get, to, to make sense of what the applications are for their business. One is that there's potentially cumulative advantage here. And so, so companies that get started earlier can get advantages that is hard for others to replicate over time. And if that happens, that can turn into something that is disruptive. You, you, you know, because the whole, whole problem with the, the I mean, the, the, why, why we talk of disruption is precisely because, you know, new technology comes in and the existing players either overlook it for a time or otherwise are not able to catch, catch on to it. It could be that they have existing businesses that are conflict or their underlying capabilities are not suited and, and so on. But, but here there's, the, there's an additional thing is that if they get in too late, um, you, you know, it may be harder to catch up. And second is that there's, there's economies of scale here. You, you, you know, you, you can use the, an algorithm once trained can be used in multiple applications at relatively low marginal cost for the application. And so there's, there's potentially significant economies of scale. So that's why, you, you know, this could be disruptive precisely in the sense that, that it gives advantages to companies that are, are, are start early and grow faster. And, and, and is this what, is, I mean, someone explained to me once the, uh, the TV wars going on, on the streaming wars between Netflix, Disney Plus, Hulu, and, and HBO, and, and it's all about getting a, a, a wider and a larger base of people selecting content and you capture all those clicks and all those streams so you know what people like and the more data you have, the better program you can get, which will get you ahead. And they're all kind of racing to get to get this massive data. Is that is that somehow explain some of these battles for market share that we're seeing in some sectors? So um, streaming is a, well, streaming is a human, hugely good example of sort of the economies of scale because you know, according to comments from Netflix engineers, the marginal cost of streaming an additional movie to, you know, Mike Rosenberg on Friday night is precisely zero. So, you know, net, the, the my stepson likes, likes Netflix. I prefer paying the three ninety nine per item. So I don't know why I'm, I'm kind of stuck in some old model. Well, regardless, the, the cost for iTunes also of streaming that movie to you is almost, almost exactly zero. So, so, so you, you know, the basically what, what that means is that the more subscribers they have, you, you know, they, the lower the average cost of every movie is and the more money, you, you know, they, they get. Because, you know, the costs are mostly fixed, the marginal, re the revenues are not. Uh, and so, you, you know, there's a huge incentive for that reason to grow as fast as possible. Now, you know, can you use that data to create new content in, in, in sort of, you know, you learn customer preferences and that allows you to create new content. I think Netflix is somewhat trying to do that. It's not clear yet to me if that's sort of successful in, in sort of content um, development. Right, right. The issue is, is storytelling is, is, is a complicated thing. Sometimes I've got a bunch of questions on different segments. Can I just tell you the different parts of the economy, what I tend to call space in, in the global economy, and then you can just react rather than read all the questions, but for example, AI and the future of medicine. Okay, AI, AI will be everywhere in medicine. Um, I, can, I can tell you a lot more about that. So 
maybe, maybe give maybe give a couple minutes on each one, and I've got four or five more to ask you about. So sure. So so in medicine, we know you, you know the the. In my innovation strategy elective in January, you know, I showed slides of a, the first actually AI generated new drug entered clinical trials. You, you know, so this, this is potentially hugely important because medicines are insanely expensive to develop and they're getting insane. They're getting more, they're more expensive at a, at a very rapid rate. And so if AI can develop medicines faster, Cheap, more cheaply, that's that's in, that's phenomenal for our society, and so that there are first me AI generated medicines are getting into clinical trials and approval process. So that's that's one on sort of the supply side, the innovation side, and same thing in sort of technology. Now the on the di on the, the the patient side, uh, we know that that that. You know, AI, you know, Google and others are developing AI diagnostics tools. They all want to get into healthcare because it's a humongous sector. And, and precisely because of those, again, those economies of scale, if you develop one algorithm to diagnose, like, like you know, in my earlier slide, brain tumors, then, uh, you, you know, you can apply that same algorithm around the world at very low marginal cost. You don't need to sort of pay additional lots of expenses to sort of have that diagnosis done. I mean, we had a guy from Watson once at, in their New York uh, campus, and then he was explaining how Watson can predict, uh, can, can identify breast cancers uh, with amazing accuracy and amazing speed. So uh, th th these are, these are um, there was a, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, there was a study on, on, on Google uh, diagnosis where they found that it was it was super good in lab but when they actually took it to the hospital it didn't quite do so well so some of those those may not be quite as ready for practice yet but this you know AI in diagnostics will be big how about the financial services industry oh um, what one of the quotes I use in my my teaching of AI is from the former CTO or sorry CFO of Goldman Sachs, where the equity equity trading desk in New York went from 600 traders to two, and and 300 programmers. And so you know AI algorithms as I right, 600 traders to 300 programmers and two guys who remembered a trick. Yes. So one, and there's another question about the stock market. Can, can AI predict stock market fluctuations up and down? I guess so. I mean, some things are fundamentally unpredictable and so we shouldn't pretend that AI can predict them. It, it may be marginally better in many cases that, than, than human managers, but it doesn't mean that it can predict them at, at a sort of, it, and, and it's a question of sort of, you, you, you may be marginally better than others, not that it's actually super accurate. Um, uh, fast moving consumer goods. Fast moving consumer goods. I've, I've had a lot of discussions with the head of AI for PepsiCo in Europe, who actually participated in our AI program as a participant. And I've had lots of good discussions with him since. So, so one of the interesting things there is, is that the fast moving consumer goods, they don't get the customer data. The retailers have the data, retailers know the customers and the retailers are using that to increasingly advantage themselves relative to the, to the consumer packaged goods, CPG companies like, like PepsiCo. And so they are sort of, you know, PepsiCo just last week launched their own online sales to sell, you know, Pepsi and other stuff directly to customers precisely to, to go directly to customers to get the data. Oh, so, so they're not selling it to bypass the channel or because of the margins, they're going it so they can actually learn about who their customers are. Well, right. I mean, in order to get them, you, those are the same thing because it precisely the, the retailers now have increasing leverage because they know the customers and they can use that advantage against the producers. Here's a, here's a question. I, I don't know exactly where the, um, it's one of the people watching on YouTube. He's asking, can it be helpful for schools and universities and, and admissions departments to kind of automate or kind of get some, get some, get some better progress? Are we, are we using it at ESA? I don't even know. Oh, uh, the answer is no, we're not yet using it at ESA. But see, see the thing, like, like I use, when I talk about AI and how it sort of should affect organizations as well, I use as a hypothetical example of doing admissions with AI. 
but but there's there's a lot of challenges in in, in sort of that application and in particular the the, the getting the outcome data and getting the missing data. So we would only have data on who we admit and we would, you know, what would be the, you know, we would have to decide, you know, this would force a very clear strategic decision on our part as to what exactly we would like, like to optimize out of, you know, the, the, the students who, who graduate from here. Well, how, do you, how do you measure that one student was more successful than another one? So what kind of students would we like to admit and so on? So, so there's, a, there's a whole lot of questions that would need to be answered before you can get into sort of applications. The trouble with that is also because the feedback data comes too slowly. The feedback data comes too slowly for admissions. You, you know, you only know, you, you know, the program is two years for, for an MBA and, and then, you know, take some time to get the feedback on, on sort of how the people perform in the workplace. So, so the feedback to sort of train the algorithm is not super fast, which makes it very difficult to train and, and improve. And then in terms of financial risk management, do you see AI having a role? Everywhere. So, you know, insurance companies are, are all over AI. Uh, I'm, I'm talking with the one large insurance company, mostly about the organizational side, but in particular because AI is, is, is finding its way everywhere there. Um, I, they, there are lots of ways in which sort of AI could work in there in terms of also helping consumers choose the right products, understanding sort of predicting risks, you, you know, optimizing the design of, of various insurance policies. So I'm saying, Matthew uh, Sanchez, he's asking, you know, how, if you're in a specific business, how do you, what, what can you do to kind of evaluate where your business is with respect to you know the risks of ai or the or the timeline of ai or the potential of ai you know if you're in the shoe business or the this business or that business you know what what, what should somebody do to figure out you know how exposed they are to this and how fast they have to run um so uh, the you, you know um well first of all i i think you, you can do various forms of of uh, competitor benchmarking. You can look at what other companies are doing just to get a sense of where, where they are and what, what, what they're doing. But, but I, I, the, the, the thing though, I, I, would, I would encourage all managers to sort of really, both in the business side and the technology side to look at the fundamental principles. What exactly is the business that you're in? What exactly is it? What is the actual customer need that you're serving? You know, how are you delivering that? And then look at sort of what exactly can this AI do? Do we have data? Do we, you know, where do we make decisions that, that could be, you know, benefit from AI? You know, do we have places where we could automate interactions like chatbots? You know, is there things we can, you know, rely on? Something like a shoe business, if you think about it, lots of the logistics in the processes, both at the outbound logistics, inbound logistics, could potentially benefit from you know, better predictive algorithms. Um, some of the, the, the you know, various kinds of robotics in the manufacturing. Right, so, this, so this thing could be used anywhere. I mean, somebody's asking about industrial marketing. I guess the answer is sure, to target certain customers to figure out who's, who you should spend more time with. So the, the, look, look, that's why we call it a general purpose technology because it can be used in so many different areas. Now, industrial marketing has its own limits in particular. So B2B marketing, if you, if, if, if you're, if you have five customers, you, you know, this is going to be far less useful than if you're doing B2C with a million customers simply because you don't have the same amount of data. So, you know, the predictive algorithms require a large amount of data. And so it's going to be, it's going to be more useful in, in parts where you do repeat predictions or decisions with lots of data. Now, I'm going to change the type of question a little bit because we have three more topics which I think are really interesting coming in from the, the uh, people watching the, 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 the broadcast. Uh, one is, one. I think this, uh, this person, Fernando Pinotto, I think he knows what he's talking about. He's asking about uh, uh, data governance. And his question has to do with, it, is, is in quality of data more important than quantity? And what kind of governance structures do you need to put in place to make sure you get quality data? 
Uh, oh, so obviously the answer to both uh, to that question is that the, the data quality is of, of essential importance. Um, you, you, you know, bad data, regardless of how much of it you have, is not going to be useful. You, you, you know, so so it needs needs to be clean, needs to be structured, needs to be organized, needs to be. Uh, there's a lot of pre-processing that has to go into it before it becomes useful. Um, and, and gender bias, is that part of the governance to make sure that there's not gender bias in the data? Because there's a specific question about gender bias. You mentioned earlier, there's a lot of work going on on this topic, but is that part, is that, does that come under governance and, and, and something like that? Yes, yes. So, so the, the governance is sort of a broad term to describe sort of how do you handle all the data? And, and sort of, you know, making sure that the data is clean, well organized, but, you know, to the extent possible bias free or, or representative of the population you're trying to serve or understand. You, you know, I mean, if you think about sort of ESA doing, for instance, admissions, you know, if we get new kinds of people that we haven't, you know, can we evaluate, you, you, you know, people from particular parts of the world, as well as people from some other parts of the world where we have less data on those people. You know, these are obviously questions that we would have to sort of discuss or, or understand. So in terms of what actually you need to put in place is, is you need to have clearly structured processes sort of to, to, to collect the data, to clean it up, to, to test it, to evaluate it. Um, yeah, got it. Now, there's a, a few questions about what could slow AI down. And there's a specific question on GDPR. What what could what could what could you know get in the way of this thing going as far as, as you think it can go? So GDPR was put in place because of sort of privacy concerns, and obviously it's it 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 had good intentions. It was intended to protect consumer privacy in terms of the data that's collected on us. However, it does have its downsides, and and you know there's more research evidence coming in the last couple of months already, or we you know now basically showing that it, it, it created a barrier for smaller companies. The, those, the, the, the cost of compliance are, are significant, part of them are fixed. And so they are hitting smaller companies more, you, you know, more than larger companies. And in fact, you, you know, the biggest beneficiary of GDPR so far is Google, clearly. And, and if you wonder why large companies are talking about regulation, it's precisely because it often helps them cement their advantage. So, so yes, regulation is essential and important, but needs to be very, very carefully designed. Now, when you talk about advantage, is, is Europe behind the US and China? And is there a global, global race for, for perfecting this stuff? And, and are we losing? And, and is there a political conflict between you know, the privacy rights guys and, and then the competitive guys. And, and is this actually a, a geoeconomic or even a geopolitical conflict going on? I, I know you, you like geopolitics. So I, I teach geopolitics, but anyway, I'm asking, I'm asking the question so I get to do that. So, so I'm, I'm gonna avoid the geopolitics part and I'm gonna answer the first couple parts because that was at least five questions in one. So, so first of all, is there a race to develop this? Absolutely. Is, is, is you know, Europe currently behind? Yes. Uh, and, and why does that matter? Precisely because of, of the potential economies of scale and cumulative advantage. You know, is the race lost? No. Um, you, you know, does Europe have a lot of smart people who can work on this? Yes. The problem is right now, many of them are in the US. If you look at you know, heads of AI at Tesla, Facebook, and elsewhere, they're all Europeans from Europe. Um, so Europe does have a lot of skills. Europe does have a lot of data. Europe has huge industrial companies. U Europe, you, you know, the, the, the issue is European companies need to get moving on this faster. Established companies from small to large need to get moving on this faster to put it in practice. And, and, and sort of, you know, there's an opportunity in, in, terms of, in terms of that. US currently, compared to Europe, I'm, I'm less aware of the China, you know, China situation, but Europe, US leads because of the large technology companies. The other American companies are not anywhere you know, ahead of Europeans. You know, GE is not head of Siemens. Google may be a different game, but, but sort of the European um, 
industrial conglomerates are pretty well positioned compared to the other industrial conglomerates, for instance. Uh, so we're getting close to the time we're supposed to stop. Um, there's a couple of questions about people and, 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 and there's kind of two sides to that question. One very specific question is, what do you think about Microsoft firing dozens of editors to replace them with AI? And then there's another question, which is kind of the flip side, which is how do you assess whether your executive team gets it or not? How do you assess if they're ready for AI, if, they're, if they've got the, the skills and, and got the mindset that they, that they need? So, okay. So what, what, what do I think of you, you, the, the broader issue here is that if we, if we go back to my very first answer, that if we want to improve productivity, that will by necessity, by force mean that some people will get reallocated to new positions and that, you, you know, yes, I agree. It's not always nice. It's not, you know, has its downsides, but that's why, you know, there is kind of a race between education and technology in the sense of, you know, and we at ESA as an educational institution are part of explicitly about part of that race of helping people get these tools, you know, get the skills and, and, and perform better in the new economy than they would without. Um, now, how do you assess? And again, I want to go back to the sort of the, the basics, you, you know, do, do that, does that executive team fundamentally understand what your business is about? Do they really get the business or do they just have a set of, you know, rules of thumb of how they keep operating or, or and so on? But do they really understand what the customer needs are, what they're serving? Do they really understand what, what the company is about on one side and on the other side? You know, do they understand what AI is, what 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 it can do, and and what 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 the capabilities are, and where the development is going? And there's a question from from uh, George Anderson. He's a banker in New York. He's, he's asking, you know, if these things are training themselves all the time, could we lose control of the technology, and maybe it gets beyond our understanding, and we just kind of have to trust it? So this is this is one of the things that you, you know. Uh, uh, what I do think that will be a big part of the role of managers in the future is not just to manage humans, but manage a portfolio of algorithms. And they need to start understanding what those algorithms are doing. You, you know, right now, if you start implementing AI, it will be more of an advisor giving you a prediction and you make a decision using that prediction and using your own judgment. However, you know, if you start actually automating decisions that, that the al algorithms do the decisions by themselves, and that means that you need to really understand what those algorithms are doing. You, you know, just like you, you need to understand who are the, the managers that you trust to make decisions for your, you know, you as a CEO cannot make all of the decisions in the company. You have to delegate and you have to trust those people. If you're automating decisions with algorithms, you have to be able to trust those algorithms and you have to understand sufficiently well how they're trained and what kind of procedures exist in case they go haywire. Samson Samela, thank you so much for being with us uh, this afternoon and telling us about AI. If I get it, it's, it's about these, this rapid digitalization that we've all experienced is only the beginning. And if we don't understand this stuff, if we don't know how to use it, we're gonna be left behind. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, if you understand Spanish a little bit, tomorrow evening we have a fantastic session with, with uh, Santiago Alvarez de Bon, who's one of the most amazing leadership professors uh, ESA's ever had. And he's uh, going to be talking with Pau Gasol from the National Basketball Association, probably Spain's best basketball player, about leadership and adversity. And, and Mr. Gasol has seen it all. And, and I think it's going to be a really interesting session. It's at a different time. It's going to be at 8.15 p.m. Uh, European time, which is going to be a little bit later in the morning uh, in the United States. And it's going to be very late at night in, in Shanghai. But of course, all of our programs are, are taped. You can watch them afterwards on LinkedIn. You can watch them afterwards on ASA's YouTube channel and La Vanguardia. So thanks for tuning in this afternoon uh, and we'll see you on the next. Thank you.